the genre that you're attracted to, and what do you find interesting about it? Well, let's, let's start first back up and, and remember that I spent several years as a playwright. I had about 15 plays produced, but it was all within the Mormon community, and scriptural, and uh, you know, based on scripture, or Mormon history, or whatever. A few things that were secular, but very few. Um, I was a complete inside guy within, within the culture, uh, Mormon culture. And so I needed to make money because I'd had a, a theater company go broke and I had to pay off the debts. And so the only thing I knew how to do was write. And I, was, I have never made any money as a playwright. I'll just tell you that right now. <laughs> I had full houses, but you can have a sellout house and an extended run, and all that means is you lose even more money. <laughs> <laughs> That's the end. Uh, but um, I tried science fiction for the simple reason that I had read some enough that I wouldn't embarrass myself. But it wasn't the main thing I read, ever. Um, but none of the other genres had a short story market where I could sample and see if I could do it. The other ones either had, you know, like, we're selling to the New Yorker, in which case I was competing with John Updike for a slot. Yeah, forget that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but with science fiction, they were hungry for new writers, and I, I knew that as soon as the short story market would discover a new writer, then he'd start writing novels so he could get paid real money. And then the short story market was open again for people like me. So that's why I started with science fiction, and that's what first sold. But I had the equivalent of bestsellers within that small puddle of uh, Mormon theater. Uh, and, and that was where I wrote my worst stuff. So I was able to come into science fiction having already written my really bad stuff where I was running along the way. Uh, but I still have not written just science fiction. It's just the only thing that people notice. I mean, somebody mentioned saints. It's a historical novel. Uh, some other people had met, earlier tonight had mentioned uh, My Women of Genesis, in which I went back to my roots in writing scriptural stories. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> somebody who, 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 liked, who liked Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Leah. And I still write. I, I basically write what I believe in and care about. And, and uh, then my agents try to sell it. <laughs> that's, that's their burden in life. Yeah. Hi. I should come over and lean in close so you can use my mic. Because they really, they're, they're, no, your back is to them. Oh, uh, my back. So, okay. yeah. All right. Um, I had a bunch of friends in high school who were in physics class, and they were asked to read your novel, and you're thinking you write an essay about how the physics worked of the anti gravity. <laughs> short story. So I had a stock, I, I, I just went to stock footage, took a stock alien, used stock science. I needed to have it be a universe in which there could be faster than light communication, but not faster than light travel. That's the rule set I needed to tell the story and for it to work. And so that's what I did. And I didn't care. And then I needed to write Speaker for the Dead, reshape Ender's Game, made a novel out of it so that it would work. And then I had to think about it a little bit more. And then, I decided to open the mind, and I had to come up with an entire metaphysics for it. And, and Shakespeare, Shakespeare tried to deal with reality when it came up. But he was lucky. None of his audience knew anything. <laughs> so he could have, in Julius Caesar, a clock strike the hour. And no one would go, they didn't have clocks back then. <laughs> But when I try to dabble in physics, I'm not a scientist. I don't even play one on TV. I just, I just wing it and I black box it. So I do metaphysical things that are below the level of known physics. Um, and that's what I'm playing with. But the physics in there, right now we're writing the Formic Wars. I'm collaborating with my good friend and collaborator, Aaron Johnston, to write. Well, the comics are going to start coming out. So they're beginning his comics, but he's also writing with me, uh, we come up with a story together, he does the, the writing. Uh, and, and the thing is, he's probably better than me, and it's gonna really embarrass me when people review it and say, Carter's getting so much better. <laughs> um, but uh, the Formic Wars, I actually have to come up with how the molecular disruption device evolved. Uh -huh. yeah. We're doing a pretty good job, but it is crap. <laughs> <laughs> I do time travel 
do a real number on time travel. I take all the paradox cliches and toss them and say, guess what? It's all causality. It's not time. So if it happened before, it stays happened. You can't go back and, well, you can go back and change the past, but you can't remove the you that went back to change it because the causal chain has to is, is what's conserved, not matter, energy, and all that other stuff. It's causality that's preserved. And I can say that because nobody actually knows what causality is. <laughs> and nobody can actually ever, ever prove causality. That's the great secret of science, is that causality is unprovable and unknowable. We can have pretty darn good guesses which are not yet contradicted, but that's all they ever are. Guesses that are not yet contradicted. So, when scientists challenge my work, I say, A, I didn't pretend to give you the blueprint for a working ship. <laughs> and B, nan nan. -na. <laughs> the person behind you is pointing at you because apparently you are with extraordinary virtues. Question will enlighten us all, so please.